So why is atmospheric pressure so very large? Uh, well, one reason is that if I look at, at myself, here I am. It's a nice sunny day out. Got maybe some clouds out here. Here's the sun. Well, the pressure, the air that is all around me, is not just being pushed on by other air. Um, it's being pushed on by a whole bunch of other air. So the air at my feet has to hold up all of the air that's above it, all the way up to my cloud over here. All of that, in fact, even beyond the cloud. The atmosphere extends up um, a very large distance well beyond the clouds. Uh, so all of that weight from all of the air on top is pushing down on us. And that's going to make atmospheric pressure be very large. Because again, the air at the bottom has to support the air on the top. Now, it's even worse when you're trying to hold up a more dense fluid. So for example, if we go to the ocean, let's say you're scuba diving. Here's you, here's your little snorkel, here's your feet, you've got some flippers on. Well, you're going to have even more pressure on you. The pressure at the bottom of the ocean is going to be larger than the pressure at the surface of the ocean because, again, the water at the bottom has to hold up all of the water above it. So the pressure at a depth is going to be greater than the pressure uh, in the shallow end of the pool or of the ocean, wherever you happen to be whatever fluid you happen to be immersed in. Okay, this video might need to get deleted if this experiment doesn't work, because uh, it's going to make a huge mess and I don't want to get in trouble. Um, I've got a huge bucket filled with water here and I have two holes. I've got a hole up here and a hole down here. Right now they're covered with tape. We're going to see what happens when I remove the tape, we're going to see how far the water shoots out. We're going to add this. They probably, probably should have lined that up better. But you can see the the lower tube is, being, is pushing out water with much more pressure than the upper tube, just based on the angle that it's coming out at. I'm going to try closing these guys up. There. It wasn't that bad of a mess. Let's see how pressure at different depths works mathematically. So we're going to compare two different spots. I'll compare here at the surface of some body of water and here at some other depth. Now I said depth, but I'm actually measuring from the bottom of the ocean. So I'm actually measuring the height off of the bottom. Uh, and if I look here, I can see that we've labeled the distance from the bottom of the body of water to the surface y1, and we've measured the depth of our diver here as y2. Now, there's a rule that says that if I look at the pressure, point 0.1, and uh, I add to that the density of the fluid times the acceleration of gravity times the height that I'm looking at, so again, looking at point 0.1 here. The pressure at point 0.1 times the density of the fluid times g times the height of point 0.1 has to equal the pressure at point 0.2, my diver will call point 0.2, plus the density of the fluid times g times y2. Now let's think about how that equation works. I know at point one, since it's at the surface of the water, it's got to be at atmospheric pressure. Here we're at atmospheric pressure. Here I've got to be at a greater uh, 
pressure. So I know at a depth I'm going to get more pressure because we're supporting the weight of the water, which means P2 has to be bigger. Well, the reason it's bigger is because the height is smaller. We compensate by uh, making the pressure bigger, but Y2, the height at that point, is going to be smaller. So using this equation, we can find out the pressure at any depth in any fluid. Consider these different shaped tubes. What's going to happen to the level of the water when I pour liquid in them? Of the four tubes, which is the liquid going to rise the highest in? We can see, no matter which tube we go in, the liquid rises to the same height. So here I have a hose spraying water into a fish tank. We're just going to see what happens when I put my thumb and cover up part of the hose. You can see the water comes out a lot faster when I do that. Why is that? Why does water come out faster when I cover up part of the hose? Now I want to consider what happens when we have fluid that's flowing. So fluid that's actually moving, it's going somewhere. Well, let's say we have a pipe. We want to consider the flow rate through the pipe. Well, by flow rate, I simply mean how much volume flows through the pipe per unit time. Now, I have to be uh, somewhat explicit here. What I am uh, going to be talking about is called an incompressible fluid. By incompressible, what I mean is that any fluid that comes in has to come out in the same amount of volume. It's incompressible, which means I can't squeeze it and make it small. I also can't pull on it and make it any bigger. It's, there's going to be the same amount of volume every time. So what that means is if I take my, pop, my uh, pipe here and I pump some fluid into it, let's say I pump, pipe, let's say I pump in, uh, Say I pump in some fluid, and the fluid goes three centimeters. Now, if my pipe has an area of 100 centimeters cubed, that would mean that the volume that went in is just going to be three centimeters times 100 centimeters squared. So that'll be so that'll be 300 centimeters cubed. All I did was I took the volume in to be the area times delta x, where delta x is how far the water uh, traveled. So I have some water flowed in a certain distance. But that had to push water out at the other end. So I have to have the same amount of water coming out on this side. So if we have incompressible fluid flow, it's got to be true that the volume in, the volume of fluid that comes in, has to equal the volume of fluid that comes out. If it's incompressible, there's no way I can push more in and then get more fluid out. Right? Matter is conserved, mass is conserved. I can't get more volume coming in than I have coming out. 
So we've shown that the volume that comes in has to equal the volume that comes out, which is equivalent to the area, uh, the cross-sectional area of the pipe, times delta x, the distance that the fluid flow. Well, what does that say about flow rate? Flow rate, we said, was how much volume you have passing through the pipe per unit time. I'm going to call my flow rate, I'll give that the symbol Q. My flow rate is equal to the amount of volume that passes by per unit time which will be equal to, by this equation, A times delta x divided by delta t. And if I look at delta x over delta t, that's a familiar quantity. We know that that is just the velocity. I'll be careful here. I'll try to make my volumes uppercase v's, which I'll draw like that with the little hats on the end. And my velocity is a lowercase v without the hats. But that will be equal to the velocity v times the area. So my flow rate is equal to the velocity times the area, or equivalently, the amount of volume passing through the pipe, volume of fluid, divided by the time it takes for that volume to pass through. And we can use this to derive uh, one more relationship that's very useful for pipes that are not the same size. Let's say I have a pipe, uh, same pipe I had before, it was 100 centimeters squared uh, in its cross-sectional area, but now I connect it to a smaller pipe whose area, I'll call A2, is only 10 centimeters squared. Let's say I'm still pumping an incompressible fluid through this pipe. All right? Well, if my fluid comes in, at three centimeters every second, I'll call that V1. Well, now I come to a problem here, because if it's coming in at three centimeters per second, that means that every second, since I have an area of 100 centimeters squared, I, every second I'd have to have 300 centimeters cubed of volume that come in. So we have some volume coming in. centimeters cubed of volume that comes in. It's an incompressible fluid. If 300 centimeters cubed of volume comes in, I have to have 300 centimeters cubed of volume that comes out. So I've got to have 300 centimeters cubed of volume, but since my pipe is smaller, that volume can't be spread out as much. It's got to be compressed more. So it's compressed into this tiny little area, which means when it comes out, I have to have it coming out even faster. So I have this much water come shooting out. It's still 300 centimeters cubed uh, every second. But it's coming out of a 10 centimeters squared area, which means it has to be moving faster. How much faster? Well, if this is 10 centimeters squared, and I need to multiply it by a velocity, because remember my flow rate, which is my volume per unit time, or velocity times the area. Since my area has gotten 10 times smaller, my velocity has got to be 10 times bigger, which means when my fluid comes out, going to be moving 10 times faster. So the velocity at this point, which we call point 2, is going to be 10 times bigger than what it was before. So now it's coming out at 30 centimeters per second. This is why if you take a hose and cover up part of the hose so that you reduce the area that the fluid can flow through, the water comes out much faster. Because whenever you make your area decrease, the velocity has to increase. The velocity of the fluid has to increase to compensate for that and keep the fluid flowing smoothly.
Here's a very simple experiment you can do involving fluid flow. Take two sheets of paper, just regular old normal sheets of paper. Now, uh, we're just going to hold them pretty close, and I'm just going to blow between these sheets of paper. I'm just going to blow down. Do you see what's happening? You can see the sheets of paper start moving towards each other as airflow is coming through them. Why is that? Why do those sheets of paper come together if air is coming through them? Wouldn't they want to push each other apart? So why do the two sheets of paper come together when I blow through them? Well, the answer has to deal with something called Bernoulli's principle. So let's look at the situation we have here. We have a moving fluid, in this case the air, passing through two sheets of paper. And I have a static fluid, again the air, but the air that's not flowing on the outside of the paper. Now, what Bernoulli's principle says is that if I have an increase in speed, so increased speed, that corresponds to a decrease in the pressure. Increased speed corresponds to a decrease in pressure. A helpful way to remember this is by looking at, uh, if you've ever had a shower curtain come and attack you as soon as you turn the shower on, you can imagine the fluid is flowing down. That's going to decrease the pressure. The shower curtain is going to be pushed in by the higher pressure air on the outside. Again, all that's going on is you always have pressure on the outside pushing in. Normally, that doesn't matter because you have equal and opposite pressures on either side. However, the amount of pressure on the inside where the fluid is flowing Ever fluid is flowing is decreased. It's not as big, so I'll draw my vector arrows a little bit smaller there. I'll use a different color to make sure that shows up. Camera. So my pressure is smaller when fluid is flowing, uh, which is why the two uh, the two sheets of paper come crashing in. Again, there's just a pressure difference, so the force is going to be unbalanced. Now, there's, a, there's an even more fun demonstration that we can do uh, involving Bernoulli's principle. And we're just going to take a ping pong ball and put it in an airstream and see what happens. Here's another demonstration of what can happen when you have fluid flow. So I have here an orange ping pong ball, and over here I have a hair dryer. So we're going to see what happens when I put this ping pong ball uh, in the airstream of the, the hair dryer. So you can see the ping pong ball is pretty stable. Right? It stayed right in the airstream, didn't go flying off. Uh, now you might think that that's because there's air hitting it on the bottom. But why is it stable? Why didn't the ping pong ball come off to either side? Well, let me show you that it actually is fairly stable. It's not just there by, by random chance. Uh, we'll see what happens when I actually try to hit the ping pong ball out of the airstream. You can see, even if I try to knock the ping pong ball out, it goes right back to the center. So what's going on there? So why is the ping pong ball stable in the airstream, even if I lightly try to knock it out? Well, we have to think about what the air is doing. So as the air is coming up and meeting the ping pong ball, it has to bend around the ping pong ball. So the flow lines have to come up, bend around the ping pong ball. As it does this, it's going to be moving a little bit faster just so it can keep up with the air that's further away from the ping pong ball. So this air comes up, has to spread out, it's going to be moving faster. 
We know from Bernoulli's equation that faster flowing air has less pressure. So as I try to knock the ping pong ball out of that airstream, I'm moving it from an area that has low pressure to an area that has higher pressure. That higher pressure is going to push more on this side than the low pressure on this side, and it'll move it back in. So it's not just a matter that the air is hitting it from the bottom and keeping it afloat. We can do an even more dramatic demonstration of this by holding the, um, the hairdryer at an angle. Let's try that now. So you can see, even at a fairly large angle, the ping pong ball is still stable. And the reason, again, is that it's a matter of pressure. It's not just a matter of the air pushing it up. It's because as the air is flowing around it, that creates a region of low pressure, which the ping pong ball will be stable. So we've talked about two ways we can change the pressure. One is by changing the depth uh, that we are in the fluid. Greater depth means more pressure because we're supporting the weight of the fluid above us. We've also talked about how uh, changing the speed of the fluid can change the pressure. Again, faster flowing fluids correspond to lower pressure. Well, Bernoulli was able to work out a single equation that takes into account both those effects. So, the system that we want to consider here, let's say we have some pipe, and the pipe maybe changes height. Uh, perhaps it changes its diameter, so at certain points it's wider than others. we're going to have fluid flowing throughout this pipe. If we consider, we can consider what happens at different locations in this pipe. So we could consider what happens in this section of the pipe, I'll call that section one, call that section two, call this section three. All of these sections have different heights. They have different velocities because as I constrict the cross-sectional area of the pipe too, so that the water has to flow through a smaller volume. We know it has to move faster because I have to have the same volume coming in as I have going out. Fluid flow has to be constant. The flow rate has to be constant, I should say. Uh, and the way to describe this is to say that the pressure at any one point plus the density of the fluid times g times the height that the fluid is at. So for example, this I could call height 1, this height 2, this would be height 3. So the pressure plus rho plus g plus h plus 1 half the density of the fluid times the speed of the flow squared. So this would be the speed in region 1, the speed in region 2, the speed in region 3. If I add these three quantities together, that has to be a constant. That is known as Bernoulli's equation. So let's just see if we can reason through how this is going to work. Well, let's just compare regions 1 and regions 2. Well, we know the velocity is going to go up in region 2. That should want to make the pressure go down. Because as my speed goes up, 
the pressure would have to go down to compensate. However, we would also have to take into account the fact that the height has gone down. So depending on which of these two effects was bigger, pressure could go up or could go down. As the height goes down, pressure is going to go up because it's got to support the water higher up. However, it's also going faster, so maybe the pressure goes up. We have to consider these two effects in order to determine what the pressure is anywhere in the fluid. The models of fluids we've been working with so far uh, have been pretty idealized. Uh, by that, I mean, when we were considering fluid flow, we assumed there wasn't any losses due to friction uh, inside the fluid. And in general, that won't be the case. So if I start fluid flowing in a pipe, it won't keep going forever and ever and ever. There's a special counterexample to that called a superfluid. But most regular fluids, uh, you're going to have some loss. The fluid will just eventually stop flowing because there's friction. Um, one way to deal with this friction is to deal with something, to consider something that we call the viscosity of the fluid. So some fluids have uh, more viscosity, more resistance to flow than other fluids. So for example, maple syrup, lots of viscosity. Molasses, lots of viscosity. Tar, lots of viscosity. Water, mm, not so much viscosity. Alcohol, not so much viscosity. What happens when a fluid is viscous? By viscous, all we mean is that there's some resistance to flow. Viscosity is the resistance to flow. How poorly does the object flow, or does the fluid flow? Well, let's say on average, my fluid is moving with some velocity that I will call the average. And I look in some length of pipe L, and the pipe, let's say it has a radius r, and I want to measure the viscosity of that fluid. Well, it turns out I can't just do what I did before. I can't just have the fluid going forever and ever. I need to set up some pressure difference so that I am constantly pushing that fluid through or else it's not going to keep flowing. So let's say the pressure on this end of the pipe is P. I'm going to need some additional pressure on this side. So we'll say it's P plus delta P. So if I have some pressure difference, then we can have the fluid flowing in the viscous pipe, in the viscous fluid. Um, well, to write my fluid flow, which again is just the change in the volume over the change in the time, it is now going to depend on a material property called the viscosity. We can write that flow as pi, pi the, the 3.14159 pi, times radius to the fourth power. So if I have a wider pipe, we'll get more fluid flow. That makes sense. Pretty good sense. Uh, it's also going to depend on the pressure difference. So if I have a bigger difference in pressure, I will get more flow. Divided by 8, we are not going to derive this equation. It's a bit uh, more complicated than we want to get into. Uh, divided by 8, divided by the length of the pipe. So if it's a longer pipe, it's going to be harder to push more fluid through it divided by that funny looking symbol that kind of looks like a weird N. The weird N is the Greek letter A, and that is the viscosity. So you can go online, you can look up the viscosities of different fluids, and depending on how viscous those fluids are, you will get different values for that eta. So molasses is going to have a very high viscosity. 
So I'll di be dividing by a big number here. We'll get a small fluid flow rate. In contrast, something like water, air, is going to have a very low viscosity. So even for small pressure differences, we will get a large flow rate. We can work out the units of viscosity again just by considering the dimensions. So I know the volume is going to be meters cubed. Delta T is going to be in seconds. And that's going to be equal to pi has no units. R to the fourth will give me meters to the fourth. Delta P will give me units of pressure, which is pascals. 8 is just a number that doesn't have any units. I want to find the units of viscosity. L is a length, so that's in meters. Well, let's see. This meter will cancel with one of those meters, and then I'll have meters cubed on both sides. Those will cancel out. So it would appear that my viscosity units are just going to be, if I move my question mark over here, my pascals over there, it would appear that my viscosity's units, do that up here, are just pascal seconds. 